right, let's start. Um, my name is Miguel Fernandez. I work for NatureServe. And I'll provide a brief introduction uh, for our guest speaker today. And then we will move to the presentation. And then we'll have um, a question and answer session where you could, um, if you want, you can ask the question live. Or if you wish, you could also type down your question in the question and answer panel on your window and we will read the question for you. So by the end of 2019, for those of us who have lived thousands of kilometers away from the place where the COVID-19 uh, disease was originated, the situation did not seem very serious. The initial attention could not be compared to an earthquake, a war, or a tsunami. But we agreed that it had a peculiarity. We knew almost nothing about it, which made it extremely attractive for ecological detectives. The appearance of some virulent disease on our planet, which caused the death of millions of people, are connected to a phenomenon called zoonosis, which in a nutshell is an animal infection that can be transmitted to humans. Today, in this special edition of the Pools of the Planet, we want to provide a healthy reminder to our audience that everything, including the coronavirus, comes from somewhere. Our guest today is Dr. Carlos Zambrana Torrelio, Associate Vice President of Conservation and Health at EcoHealth Alliance, a New York-based nonprofit organization that works at the interface of animal and human health. Carlos is a biologist by training, and after completing his master's degree in the US, he earned his PhD at Sapienza University in Italy, focusing his research on the relationship between zoonotic diseases, biodiversity conservation, land use planning, and the economic implications of their interaction. Carlos is the current chair of the working group of, at IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management, and he has led the creation of the Biodiversity Observation Network of the Americas under Geobon Umbrella. He is an active member of the Nature <laughs> Board of Directors, fully involved in conservation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Carlos has also been advisor to the CBD and co-author IPBES evaluations. He's author of uh, multiple chapters in books and countless publications in high impact journals. Dr. Zambrana, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Miguel. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's really my pleasure and an honor to be <clears throat> talking with all of you uh, here. And <clears throat> we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about the, the current situation and what are the, what are the things that we did to, to, that led us to, to, to the current problem. Um, briefly, I want to mention that this is not the first time that um, diseases or a pandemic this size happened in our in our human history. These are just a few examples that you can <clears throat> see um, on your screen that happened over the past um, centuries. And for example, in, in 1350, the Black Death that uh, um, attacked um, Europe, we had a human population around that 450 million. Um, during those um, during that that year, and it came down to between pretty much reduced in a hundred million people, and this was because of the the black that, that it was produced by this pathogen, Yersinia pestis, that came um, infected humans from uh, from fleas, and the, the fleas came in, in, uh, from rats. Um, it's similarly in 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 the Americas when when Christopher Columbus arrived in the first expedition. And he brought some diseases. He brought um, measles, smallpox, and in, in 100 years, pretty much 90% of the, of the indigenous uh, population uh, uh, fell. And there are some estimates that in Mexico, the, the population fell from 15 million people to 1.5 million people. So, in, in, And in some cases, it led to the extinction of these uh, indigenous communities. More closely to, 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 this, to, to the past century, the Spanish influenza, there were several uh, uh, outbreaks of Sp um, Spanish influenza, but in, the, in 1980, it, it's estimated that between 50 to 100 million people uh, in the, uh, died during that, that uh, epidemic. So, <clears throat> and in our most recent history over the past um, uh, 30, 40 years, We've seen other epidemics growing in, or, or happening in, in our in our in our planet. So, for example, we have the the HIV that uh, originated in Africa and, and in the 80s. We recently had the um, the H1N1, the new strain, the swine flu. Of course, we are talking about now about COVID-19. But also, there were 
a small uh, epidemics that happen and, and they are more, more regional, that they, they, they didn't spread across the world. Like for example, the Nipah virus outbreak in Malaysia or Bangladesh, or the SARS that happened in, in, in China, or the West African Ebola that recently happened a few years ago, or even MERS, another coronavirus that uh, uh, emerged in the Middle East. And so we are constantly having these, these outbreaks. But what are behind these drivers? What are, what are, what are what are the, the, the what is behind these drivers? What is what are the underlying factors that explain these drivers? I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk about what's going on in our planet right now. So this is a picture that I took last week when I gave them the presentation in Spanish. This is in April two, and at that time we had around one million people infected with COVID, and this is the same the same screenshot that I took that I took this last night, and you can see we have more than one more than 600 people, 600,000 people infected. We had more than 45,000 people that died in over the past week, but also there are some, some around 150,000 people that, that recovered. So can you see the, 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 the impact that this disease is having in our, in, our, in our lives right now? But we are not just fighting the coronavirus. The, this is this is an outbreak. These are outbreaks, current outbreaks that, that happened in the last week, uh, but these are not coronavirus related. These are other diseases. There are all, also we are fighting these diseases in different parts of the world, and these diseases could include dengue, malaria, yellow fever, other types of influenza, other types of respiratory diseases that are happening right now. So we are constantly battling these diseases. So how, how uh, where, where did we, we, we get these diseases? Well, most of these diseases come from, from, from viruses, a bacteria, all these microorganisms, and we are surrounded by viruses. This is a nice picture showing that we are completely surrounded by viruses. This is, um, we call this viral diversity. Some people call it the virosphere, viral diversity, but it's, it's essentially to show that we are surrounded by viruses and the viruses then have a role in our ecosystems. They are an important um, part of the bi biochemical um, cycles in the oceans. They regulate popu uh, animal populations. They structure animal communities. So they, they are in nature right now. And there are some estimates that there are more than a thousand um, 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 million um, viruses in one ml of uh, uh, water from, 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 from the ocean. So we are all the time surrounded by, by viruses. But what are these viruses? This, this is a nice uh, uh, um, illustration from um, Sinepstad in, in Mexico. But, but essentially, um, viruses are, are, are um, there is a big discussion if viruses are alive or or, or not. They, they represent they are, and but that's more and at some point that's philosophical. But the important part of this is that the viruses need to infect a human a, a host cell to reproduce, and all organisms, all live organisms, can be infected. We are talking about fungi. We are talking about bacteria, other parasites, plants, animals. All of them are susceptible to a, a viral infection. And that's extremely important. Viruses are replicating, they are, they're reproducing within uh, host cells. And this is important because from time to time, there are some um, viruses that cause a disease in humans. So most of the, 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 the known human infection diseases, they come, have an, an animal origin. And those are the, we call zoonotic. Zoonoses are uh, a disease that there are, have an origin in, in animals. Most of our diseases come from animals. And, and, and the reason is, 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 is very simple, is because we, as a humanity, we are also animals. So we share these, these viruses with, with wildlife. And, and examples of these diseases can be rabies, influenza, Ebola, toxoplasmosis, all different diseases that we are all the time hearing. And in, in average, we have more than 1 billion human cases every year of these diseases. And, we are, and, and this is uh, like all the diseases, all the diseases combined. So what we did in, at Eco Health Alliance, we, we collected information on the first emergence of an infection disease. So for example, the first time that Ebola emerged from, the, um, from animals to humans, it has one entry in our database, and then you can visit this um, our website. The, the 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 website is on the top, 
And these are a few examples of these viruses. So for example, the first time that West Nile emerged in New York in 1999 represents one entry in our database. So that it's, and then I, uh, you can see that on, on, the, on the left side. The first time that Ebola emerged in, in in, in, in humans in 1966, it's right there. And also we have another example here, that's Nipah virus that emerged in Malaysia. So we have over one, 400 events, emerging infection disease events that emerged into humans since 1940s. So we've been looking at this and we've been trying to understand what are the, the, the general patterns of these, um, these diseases. So in average, oh, this is in Spanish, sorry. In average, we have, um, two to three new zoonotic events every year. That means like one new zoonotic event every four months. And sometimes, in most of the cases, we don't really capture this because we don't have the health systems to identify or to recognize that, that something happened. And in some cases, some, some people get sick and it's a small outbreak, but there's those, those outbreaks are not reported to, to the health authorities. We estimated there are around two to three pandemic events every 100 years. So that's the other thing that we were able to, to, to get from that um, database. And some of the most recent cases, of course, we have the, the SARS-2 coronavirus, the Zika virus that um, emerged uh, a couple of years ago, Zika, uh, MERS, or H1N1. And on the, on the right side, you can see that disease, these diseases have been increasing over time. The, the white parts of, the, of, of those uh, columns is showing that the number of um, zoonotic diseases are increasing over time, with a peak in this case in the in the 80s, 90s, because um, um, we believe that um, HIV had a, an important impact on the human population and the immune, immunological system uh, of the people got down. So where are these diseases happening? Where did this disease happen? So this is a map um, um, based from from a similar database uh, or, uh, where we show that the most of the diseases emerge in Europe and in North America. But this is actually not, uh, the, the one of the problems, that there is a research bias. There's more people working on these uh, disciplines in these in this parts of the world. And there's also more investment, there's more, mm, more investment in science and education uh, in, in these areas. Mm, to, to show that, uh, this is a, a map showing the number of publications on the Journal of Infection Diseases. And you can see that in, in yellow represents the high number of publications and, and blue represents the lowest number, uh, I think one publication. And you can see pretty much the U.S. is leading. The, uh, people from the U.S. publish more frequently and more papers in, in this journal. And this is because there are more, more, uh, more research um, investment in, in, in this area. So that's the reason that w these people are working more in this the, this field and they are publishing more but that doesn't mean that the the diseases are happening really in these areas actually when we did we did an analysis of the hotspots of emerging infection diseases we created this predictive model and we use mm, different the, the database that I, I showed before but also we use a, a predictor uh, uh, factors to understand this emergence so for example areas with tropical forest where human population are growing with places with high mammal biodiversity, and mammal biodiversity in this case represents it's a proxy, it's a it's a proxy for viruses and land use change. Places where there's an active land use change, they have a higher probability, a higher risk of an, an, a new and novel emerging infection disease to happen in that area. So this is um, this is uh, this is one of our, uh, our um, uh, recent work that is showing that these the yellow areas are uh, places with higher risk of infectious diseases. Um, <clears throat> What are the other underlying causes of disease emergence? So I separate this in three important um, um, uh, components. The first one is I'm going to talk about changes in the environment. The second, I'm going to talk about changes in animals or in humans, human behavior, for example. And that includes a, a wildlife market. Changes and changes in the pathogen. This important uh, component that the pathogens are also changing. So um, environmental, um, and factors are extremely important. 31% of the new emerging infection diseases are due to land use change. And then I have a couple of examples. This, this is, this, this, these are um, remote sense images from different parts of the world. On the bottom left, we have uh, Santa Cruz. That's a, a different pattern of, um, of, um, of deforestation with a small uh, village in the, right in the center of the, this radial um, areas. And then, and then deforestation is happening 
in this like like pizza shape essentially and then we have different types of, of, of use of the landscape and all of them have an impact on 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 how we interact with wildlife so for example this is a, a, a this is an example from panama this is hantavirus and hantavirus is um it's a type it's a, it's a type of um it's a virus that that uh, produce a um a disease that's called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome that, that again spill over from from rodents and the reason that we 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 there are studies suggesting that um, fragmentation that is the creation of these small pockets of forest in the landscape are related to to uh, to the increase of abundance of these uh, animals so in these patches of forest <clears throat> there are more um the the rod these rodents are more abundant there are more animals and also in the forests that are more isolated these these small patches that are completely isolated uh, from from the continuous forest and also these places have um less abundance of all and less diversity of other rodents and it is in these places that the the the, the these rodents have higher prevalence higher number of um, higher load of of, of hantavirus another example it's from from bolivia this is another arena virus this is the machupo virus it's called the bolivian hemorrhagic fever the same thing the hosts are uh, the rodents are, are, are hosts um, for for this virus and in this case uh, we think it's related to the increase and in abundance of um, of these rodents in sugar cane and perhaps in rice plantation and then there's like uh, hum, uh, rodents are coming after the resources coming after the, the rice or coming after the the sugar cane they can they are able to reproduce they have they increase their numbers and they can infect people and in this case it's the the way that um, the the harvesting of the sugar cane is happening it's, it's it's not mechanized in many cases it's by hand so people are more closely closely contact with these uh, viruses the control that it's been in, in some in sometimes and this is very common in different parts of the world is that to eliminate all rodents but not all rodents are able to uh, uh, to transmit or they are not able to they don't carry the, the disease but in this case all rodents are are are, are blamed and then this is a uh, this, this 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 wall of rodents uh, that rodents happen and unfortunately there's a similar thing that's in some uh, it's happening with coronaviruses and bats in um and these days mm, another important environmental uh, component is climate change this is a work that we did with with um, miguel this is showing the future potential distribution by 2050 of bats that carry genipa virus genipa virus another group of viruses that um, has two different uh, viruses, Hendra virus and Nipah virus, that has an, an important um, uh, econo uh, economic and people uh, human impact in, in Malaysia and in Australia. And in the red areas, we are showing that the, the, these bats are expanding or could expand their, um, their, their environmental suitability. Uh, they, they can move to these new areas, the red areas, so, and potentially bringing the disease, bringing the viruses to another parts of the world that the, 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 these bats are not present, and of course the disease is not present. So this is, uh, climate change is an important component. The next one, and this is an interesting paper from my colleague uh, that works at NASA. Um, this is uh, uh, showing the, the, um, the increased incidence uh, of some diseases due to um, extreme anomalous rainfall due to el nino or la nina they you know they, they're more frequently uh, more frequent um, el nino or la nina events that are changing the dynamics of rainfall precipitation in the world so a few examples of this is that it, the, 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 there's more incidence of hantavirus and plague in the united states or for example that are, um, there are more incidents of cholera in tanzania and dengue has increased dramatically in Southeast Asia and Brazil, and everything is related to climate change. <clears throat> what are the other, uh, this other, uh, the, the other factor is the change in animals or, or humans. Um, the one that I described before, the direct transmission from, uh, direct zoonotic transmission from wildlife to humans, is very rare. It's not very common. So there are other ways to, to there are other, other, other pathways that uh, animals can get, um, or, or humans get, the, get infected with a disease. So I separate this in three levels. So there's a one interface that it's wildlife to domestic animals, and that's, that, that happens and it's important. Um, then we have domestic animals to humans, and then we have this mix of wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. And I have a couple of examples of each one. 
So wildlife and, and, and livestock uh, interfaces is extremely important. It has important economic impacts on, on the livestock production around the world. So a few examples of these are uh, in birds and poultry, for example, in North America or in Europe or in China. Then we have the, in, in China, for example, we have the um, a highly pathogenic avian influenza that and in some cases, and you probably heard that, that leads to the closure of, of, of these farms and then they kill millions, thousands of, of, of chickens that are infected with one of these diseases. In other parts of the world, we have rodents transmission to, to, to cattle or, or, for example, in Australia, we have marsupials infected to, to livestock. And they, this is happening constantly every year, every day in, in, around the world. So it's important to, that, to recognize that there is this other interface that has important economic impacts. The other one, and we don't talk too much about this, but it's important, is domestic animals to humans. Um, and this is, this is extremely interesting. Uh, Rinder Press was a, a, a plague. It, it was a disease in cattle that <clears throat> it, it was uh, decimating millions. It's killing, killing millions of, of, of cattle. And you can see that in that mirror in, 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 in the image. Um, and we were able to control, um, I believe in 2011, we were able to pretty much eradicate or, or at least control in the world a, a rinder pest. But, um, but from rinder pest, measles diverged in around the 12th century. And from there, it jumped into humans. So there's like a new strain of, of rinder pest that now circulates within humans. There's no transmission, back transmission to domestic animals. This is only circulating in humans. We have a, a, a vaccine, but unfortunately, some people are not using the vaccine. And we have these outbreaks, important outbreaks of measles, for example, here in the US. But this, is, this came originally from, from, from domestic animals. And finally, we have, this is a, a very interesting case that we have this interface of why domestic animals and humans. And the N1 novel influenza, new strain in that emerged in Mexico. In Mexico, we had, um, or we, in this in this case, we have um, pigs that uh, got some uh, type of some of a flu, uh, and then the pig got infected with a, a, a flu from from bird and a flu from 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 humans, and it got mixed, it got recombined, and then created a new strain that infected um, humans, and then of course it it, it went to a, a pandemic event in in in, in the other time. The other important component of this is the legal and illegal wildlife trade. So this is a, a, a paper that we published this year that showing the, all the uh, live uh, organisms imported into the, into the US. This is only import, importation to the US and includes all li living organisms that for some reason people have some interest. So for example, fish or some mammals, frogs, every single thing it's here. But it's, it's happening and we are getting more and more animals uh, every year. Um, but it's important. And, and in 2003, uh, the, there were, we, uh, the US imported some uh, gabion uh, poach rats for, for pets, as you can see in the picture. But in this, the, originally these pets come from, uh, these rats are from, um, from Africa. And in 2003, there were 71 cases of human uh, monkeypox. Um, a monkeypox is a disease that's endemic to Africa, but it emerged here in the U.S. And this is because we were importing these animals. Now there's a ban in, uh, on African rodents since 2003 to avoid this problem. But this was originally due to legal wildlife trade. And of course, that leads us now to the illegal wildlife trade. And that's the origin of some diseases. So for example, SARS and SARS-2 emerge from... Um, and the, the official um, um, account of this is the emerge in, 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 in the Wuhan market in, in China. But in SARS, in, uh, SARS, the first SARS emerged in 2002, it was very similar. Uh, it was originated from bats and then they spill over to, to civets and then from civets to humans. And the one we, we are discussing now, most likely the evidence suggested that had a, um, an origin in bats as well. So as you can see in the picture in this is in, 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 in China. This is how the people are, are in, in some of these markets are, 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 are um, trading, are, are killing some, some, some animals. And that's how like the, the, 
the disease, uh, the viruses are mixing with all uh, with other animals and also jumping into humans. Um, what, are, what about the origins of of, uh, um, of coronavirus two, uh, the, the one that we're discussing? So um, we believe that we are we're discussing now two hypotheses. The first one it was the a natural selection in an animal host before a, a zoonotic transfer. Uh, how why we think that we think that in um, uh, the, the, the current virus that's circulating in humans is 96 similar to a, to a, a, a coronavirus that was found in a bat. Um, but not all the, 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 the sequence, it's, it's, it's very similar. There are, there are some regions of the genome that are, 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 have some similarity with proteins that are found in, in pangolins. So we, that's why one of the hypotheses that the, the virus infected a pangolin and then the pangolin uh, had another coronavirus that uh, recombined in the pangolin and then from there jump into humans. And the other hypothesis that natural selection is in, in, in happening in humans following a zoonotic transfer. That means that uh, humans were infected, or directly infected with, with a virus, uh, with, a, uh, with a SARS virus. And then the, this protein that is necessary to infect humans it evolved or it mixed within the human population. And then it became a, a, a spread to different parts of the, or to different humans. So that's one of the, these are the two hypotheses that we are, we are managing. We, we, we will, we need to do more, more work. We need to do more, more research on this to, to try to and find the, the answer to this hypothesis, but this will take um, um, more time and more research, of course, in China. The other important part of this human behavior, and then this is interesting, this is Nipah virus that I mentioned before, but this is the emergence of Nipah virus in Bangladesh. And, and Nipah virus, uh, it's, um, um, it uses um, um, bat flying foxes as a, as a host. And you can see on the left figure, these are the flying foxes. Uh, the, the, and then flying foxes, they, 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 they are diurnal animals, so are different as the other animals, other bats in the world. But these are these are fly, uh, flying foxes, and this this guy on the on the right side, he's collecting the sap from 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 a palm. So he's collecting this sap, and then in in this small uh, bucket there, and from there, um, they next they they leave that overnight, and the next day they pick up these buckets and they they drink the the, the sap similar to to um, um, maple syrup that uh, in in some places. Um, and here, uh, uh, let me see. So this is a bat. This is uh, on, on the left side. You can see that it's the bucket. That's the, the, the that's the palm. And that the this, the the bat is coming and it's checking. It's it's trying to it's trying to get the sap because it's sweet from 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 the tree. And then that moment is when he's urinating, and that's a direct transfer from from urine with probably viruses into the bucket with. With a um, with the sap that next day the people uh, people in Bangladesh are going to drink, so and that's an extremely important interface. This is and an, this is we are invading the the the, um, and the the resources. We are uh, we are we are very in very close contact with these bats, and that's how the the, the transfer of viruses into um into um into humans. So uh, here. So now the next question is if bats are special. Yes, the bats are extremely special. And we probably we've been hearing more and more of the past few weeks. And I'm glad about that because they're important uh, animals that uh, um, disperse seeds. They take seeds from one place to another place. They pollinate uh, in, uh, in fruits, plants. But I want to highlight two things here. Um, and on the left side, we have durian. It's a fruit that it's in highly uh, people. A lot of people like in in, in Malaysia, um, and do, bats are are, are the, the, the pollinator of this, this fruit. Uh, and durian is extremely important element in the in, in, in Southeast Asia, and it has a, a really big economic impact in the region. So without bats, we didn't have um, um, durian. And say same thing with tequila. And this is always a good example because most people like tequila, I like tequila, but bats are the pollinators of um, the agave that is used to make tequila. So without bats, we didn't have tequila and that's really, really bad. Mm. And we won't be able to enjoy this, uh, this tequila shots that uh, people so much like it. Um, but also 
it has an important economic component. Can you imagine how much money these two services that are, are doing? And this is just two examples. They're, they are doing this with other species as well, with other plants, with other um, products as well. So the, the, the economic impact will be massive if we kill these animals. However, we need to be very careful um, and getting in contact with these animals. We show, and this is a paper that we published um, uh, three years ago, we show that Chiroptera, the bats, in general have more viruses that can carry more viruses than other mammals. And that's probably, be, that's, we believe that's because they, have, they are the only mammals they can fly. And where they are flying, they, they, it's incredible the, all the, 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 in, in, the, the, the in physiological adaptation that these animals have, um, have evolved. And they, they reach very high temperatures when they are flying. And we believe that that is related to the way that they can handle uh, the viruses. But don't get sick with these viruses. They are just carrying. Actually, we can learn so much for human health on the way that viruses are handling these thousands of, uh, or, or several um, uh, groups of viruses in their bodies. So we can learn from these animals. On, on, on the, the, the map on the bottom is showing the potential distribution of some coronaviruses based, um, based on the distribution of bats. In, in red areas are, are places where potentially we could find coronaviruses, but we never heard about these coronaviruses, probably you haven't heard about these coronaviruses before this outbreak. So this is actually happening, and this is actually distrib the distribution of, of, of potential distribution of bats uh, of coronaviruses in the world. But we never heard of, uh, about outbreaks from, from coronaviruses as, until recently. And that's because we are more and more encroaching into the uh, uh, bat habitat. This is an interesting paper. I haven't read it in detail. This came this week from uh, Christine Kruder Johnson at UC Davis. But the great thing about this paper, and I'm so glad that uh, she published this paper, is that it, in, in general, she showed that threatened species, the ones that are critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable, due to reduction in the populations and due to exploitation and loss of habitat, share more viruses with humans. So humans, we are constantly entering the, the, the habitats of these animals and we are getting more and more and more in contact. And probably we, we are, we are not probably, we are the reason that these, popula these, these animals are getting into uh, they're increasing their extinction risk. So it's our fault that these animals are getting into that, that category. But also we are getting the feedback, the negative feedback is that we are getting more diseases. So it's an extremely important message that um, it's in this paper. I need to read that in more detail now. Um, uh, what are we are doing to, to, to minimize this problem? So we are doing a lot of outreach. We, we in uh, Eco Health Alliance, you can, you can find that in, in this, this booklet, book, uh, booklets. In our, in our website at Equal Talent, we developed this program. It's called Living Safely with Bats. And now we are working on um, another one. It's called Living Safely with Wildlife. It's been translated to different um, languages. Um, but one that we explain about the, the benefits, the, the, the importance, the role of benefits, the, the contributions to nature that, um, uh, or nature contributions to people, sorry, that they, we get the, from, from bats. But also we talk about how we can live safely with that. For example, if a bat drops a fruit, it's not free food. You should be extremely careful on how to dispose that, that fruit. Also, the same thing, don't let your animals eat the fruit from or this, this um, droplets from, from, or this fruit that has been dropped by, by a bat. So it's important and we are reaching communities. We are working with commun local communities to teach them about, about, about bats. Mm, and also, the other part important, this is really important measure is that um, there was a, a new virus that emerged in 2012 in, in South Sudan and Uganda, and there was a, a female wildlife biologist that got infected with this animal. And probably, I know her, and probably I need to check with her, probably she didn't use uh, uh, the protective equipment, but this, uh, this is um, wildlife biologist diseases, uh, or, or people working with diseases, sometimes they get exposed to these uh, diseases as well. And there are a few cases of plague in, in here in the U.S., and there are a few examples of of wildlife biologists that have been exposed to, to viruses. So we need to be careful. But it's not just that we just get the, the viruses and, and, and the wildlife is fine. It's actually both ways. So there are some diseases that we humans have transmitted to, to, to wildlife. Um, these are a few examples that we gave, for example, polio in chimpanzees. 
or 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 Ebola uh, to to some in, in in gorillas, we also infect wildlife. And then recently, the most in, in, uh, recent case is that someone and uh, here in New York and, and the zoo park and in the Bronx Park infected a tiger. So we humans are also able to transmit these diseases to wildlife. Uh, on the right side, you can see there is a call for um, uh, to 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 understand the, the impact on on great apes uh, health due to human pandemics, because if we get uh, infected, it is likely that primates are going to get infected as well, because we are very closely related. So this could lead to the local extinction of all these uh, uh, non-human primates. Finally, there is this component on the changes in 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 the pathogen. So these are um, a decent, an interesting example uh, of drug resistant, uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance. So an antimicrobial resistance emerge or, or happen because there is a misuse and, or an overuse of antimicrobial drugs. So for example, every time that I, I'm, some, some of my kids get sick and I take him to the, uh, to the doctor, it, it usually leads to, to a, a, a prescription of um, antibiotic. And probably you heard this many times that please, if you're gonna be using antibiotics, use the entire time. Like it's an, if it's 10 days, 14 days, whatever it is, do not stop the treatment because the, 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 the bacteria or whatever you are treating, it's, it, it gets resistant from this. One of the biggest problems is that it's, right now it's used for everything in humans, but the other part is that anti, anti, antibiotics are used for, as prophylactic in, in livestock. So, and, and poultry. So daily or probably once a week, livestock are, feed, are, 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 are treated with antibiotics to prevent, as prevention and, and, and treatment, not as to, um, to reduce a disease, but as a prevention. So there's, the, the, there's when the, 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 the moment that all this anti, anti, the, the res resistance to antibiotics is happening. And that eventually is going to lead to, and we have here a few examples of, these superbugs, um, uh, um, uh, microbials that we cannot treat with the current uh, antibiotics, and that's leading to the creation of the research for antibiotics of uh, fourth generation. And we we need more and more and more research. We do more and more and research on, on on trying to control these um, these microorganisms. But we are we are directing the evolution of these organisms and we're, we humans are making harder and harder to control. So this is one example of change in, in, in pathogens that, will, that eventually will affect uh, humans. The system, our planet, our, our, our ecosystem has barriers to spillover. So we need to be really, it's like aligning planets for a, a spillover event to happen. So in the, if, if we, we've seen all these outbreaks, but it's because everything has aligned perfectly to happen. So for example, we need to have the, 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 the presence of an animal in an area. That's what the first layer, the first step of this, of, 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 of this figure, the reservoir host distribution. We need to have the animal present in an area. Second, we need to have a, a, a an adequate density of this animal. Because if we have 10 um, um, bats per one kilometer square, it's nothing. The probability that uh, I, as a human, are going, I'm going to interact with this animal is very low. So we need a little bit higher density of, of, of reservoir. Second, we need, or third, we need a prevalence of the pathogen. The pathogen, the virus, is not really, is not present in all, all the time. It might, it, it's changing over time, it's changing because of the stress of the animal, it's changing because of the environmental stress, it's changing because of several things. So we, the, we, need, to be, we need to have the animal present with an appropriate density, but also the virus needs to be active in that animal. The other part of which is important is that we need a, a, a release, a pathogen release from the reservoir from, from, from this animal. So how do we do that? So for example, for rabies, we need to get bitten by a, bat, by a, by a dog, right? So that's the release. That, that, that the only reason that we don't get that is if we get very in, in close contact with a dog and the dog needs to be present there, of course. 
then we need, and that's related to how humans are, are exposed, how humans behave in front of these um, in, in, in wildlife or these animals. Finally, we as a humans, we have a structural barriers. We have an immunological response to these viruses. We know that the spillover or, or, or yeah, spillover jumps from, from, from uh, of viruses to humans are happening probably all the time. But it's probably not really an infection to us. It's just going to jump a virus into our in, into our into our skin, for example, and it's not going to be able to penetrate our skin, or we're going to get a mild disease, and then we we will be fine because we have a, 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 an immune response. Remember, we've been evolving with these with these viruses for 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 thousands of years, so we have some immunological response. So we so in order to get a spillover, all of these things need to happen. So can you believe how hard it is that uh, we get uh, uh, um, an event like coronavirus? We really are changing the way we interact with animals and we are stressing these animals in order to get this disease. Finally, this is extremely important that in order to study, in order to understand the spillover, and not in order to prevent this to happen in the future, we need to work in an interdisciplinary manner. We need to work on this paradigm of one health eco-health, planetary health, whatever you want to call it, it's important because we need to talk with ecologists, veterinarians, and medical doctors, economists, policymakers, all different disciplines, and all we need to share the same language. One of the biggest problems that we have in our disciplines is that we all have our own language and it's extremely difficult to uh, interact. What is the challenge? Well, the challenge is that we need to feed our growing human population. So by 2050, it's estimated that we will be 9.6 billion. So how do we feed all these, uh, all these people? We need to start thinking, smart thinking, smart feeding all, the, all, all of us. And, and the reason we are in this problem is because we are expanding, we are creating more space to feed our population. So it's estimated that we will need to double the production of crops in order to feed these 9.6 billion people. And if we are going to be doubling the, 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 the production, probably we will need more space. And that means we will get more and more in contact with wildlife. And probably these, these, these spillover events, these pandemics will increase as well. So just to summarize, um, we need to we need to keep this ecosystem health. It's important for us that we need to understand this that all of us are interconnected. We are all part of the system. So we need to prevent. We need to understand. We need to be a part of the, of the solution as well. So forest logging, clearing for agricultural, mining, all of these things are related are, are degrading the, the, the ecosystems and are related to the emergence of infection diseases. We used to be separate from animals, like in general, one because we weren't really getting so much in contact with this, with this uh, wildlife uh, and, and their pathogens. But now we are all the time increasing our our, our uh, agricultural frontier and getting in contact with these animals. In general, what we are doing is is extremely is, um, extremely bad. We are developing too much, too fast, and in the wrong places. And we are going to be getting more and more diseases if we don't change our ways really. Um, in order to, 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 to try to integrate different fields and trying to understand what, are the, what all these relationships that I just explained, um, with, the, with the IUCN uh, Commission of Ecosystem Management, we created a task force on human health and ecosystem management for the direct invitation of Angela Andrade. So thank you so much, Angela, for, for facilitating that and, and for your vision on, on, on on creating this task force. It's extremely important that this, this is a platform where we can, inter, in, um, we can interact different disciplines and then start to think and start to respond or pro, pro, provide response to all this ongoing problem. Finally, I want to mention that, um, that this is all these things that I discussed, all, all, all the emerging of infection diseases is extremely, it's a key component, it's an extremely important component of the sustainable development uh, planning, the sustainable development goals. And uh, this is an example, and uh, this is a publication that you can find in, in Brazil's National Academy of Science. And, and we, we, where we discuss how uh, human health can be integrated with a reduction of, um, with biodiversity conservation, 
with food production, and also it will allow us to reduce uh, the emerging infection disease risk. So think uh, if uh, next time think about the, the, the this uh, health as a um, cross-cutting discipline that is going to help us to 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 achieve some of these goals. Finally, I want to thank our hundreds of collaborators in the world um, and um, different institutions that have funded me uh, and me and my organization over uh, over the past ten years. We have USAID. I've been working with Johnson and Johnson closely. Uh, many the private sector. It's extremely interesting, extremely supportive of the work that we are doing, and they are very um, very supportive of this work. So these are all different groups that have been supporting uh, uh, Eco Health Alliance's work. With that, thank you so much, and I'm I'm happy to answer some of your questions. Thank you so much, Carlos, for that fantastic talk. We learn, uh, I learn uh, a lot. There, there are some uh, questions uh, from the audience, and I, um, we go ahead with one, one very, very interesting that caught my attention. Uh, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, is asking for transformative change. 9.6 billion people is not transformative. So how to do? Um, can you repeat the question, sorry? Sure. The IPBES is asking for transformative change. 9.6 billion people is not transformative. So how to do? <laughs> good question. Yes, yeah, a good question. Uh, we've been discussing that the underlying problem, uh, well, uh, our underlying um, factors, the problems, uh, it's deforestation, habitat loss, uh, climate change. But you're right. The underlying problem is this uncontrolled human population growth. Um, really, no one is talking about that. And, and that requires, um, the UN doesn't discuss about that because it has components of, like ethical, it's, 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 uh, we need to discuss about ethics as well. Uh, who, who am I to say like to some people do, do not, don't have kids? Who am I to say like all this, or, you know, like in the US should stop reproducing, <laughs> should stop growing human population growth in, in, in China? Who am I? There have been some examples in China, try, they try to control this. And then we have their, their other issues, social issues arise. But the underlying problem for all, actually all the humanity problems is this, this control, human, uncontrolled human population growth. We need to start discussing about that, how, there's no way that from here, from 50 years from now, we are going to be in a better place. But so we need, we need, we should start discussing about human population growth now. Excellent, Carlos. Thank you so much. Uh, we have um, several other questions. I'm trying to 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 organize them a little bit. Um, the one I can read one. I can read one uh, that came in the chat. Um, thank you, Carlos, for a very informative and wonderful um, webinar. Um, uh, the question is, have you found that there is a certain percent mortality rate that produces a different response in humans? At what level of mortality do people actually respond and change their behavior, thus reducing the spread of the disease? Mortality, I'm not sure if I follow. Um, mortality in humans? Uh, at what level of mortality do people actually, res actually respond and change their behavior, thus reducing the spread of a disease? If I understand yeah. that, um, I'm not, to be honest, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand. Um, but um, uh, at what level of mortality people change their, their behavior? Um, are we talking about the current uh, about social behavior? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say it again. I, I guess this is about the social behavior. Social behavior due, due the, because of the, the, the latest outbreak. Well, let, let me let me let me let, uh, let me answer what I understand. So, um, yeah, it's in we, terms of the severity we, of the disease. Uh, what kind of severity will be required for us to change behavior? It it that it's relative, right? Uh, let me give you an example. Um, Liberia suffered like one of the biggest outbreaks of Ebola a few years ago. Um, there were literally people dying on the streets, so uh, and it had a huge impact 
on the society of uh, Liberia society. Now, this day, I was in Liberia two months ago, um, right when, when, the, when, the, um, when the coronavirus was uh, not the, at, the, at the beginning of the, the epidemic. And Liberia were better prepared to deal with the coronavirus at that moment than the US or other countries that I've been, I, I was visiting at the same time. Why? Because they, they suffered really, they, they're, I can remember, like, I think 60,000 uh, people died during that outbreak. They, they already had at that time, they were, they were the first ones to check in temperature and the first one asking everybody to wash their hands in, in at the airport, not, not even just out of the, 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 the plane. I had to, they, they checked my temperature and I had to uh, wash my hands. And that was everywhere. I had to wash my hands to enter the, the, the hotel, to visit any public building. Everywhere was aware of the situation. And why? Because they suffered a huge, a massive mortality because of, of, of Ebola. So these things, they get into our, um, into our behavior. They really had big impacts. And then unfortunately, we as a humans learn, real, like it, it's very hard for us to learn, to, to change our ways. So suffering that in Liberia really changed their behavior. Second, what happened is that the Liberian government created this platform of One Health that is inserted in the, in, in the government. And the vice president of Liberia is the head of this, the chair of this One Health platform. And every year, every week they meet and they discuss what are the current outbreaks of, in Liberia and how they can um, reduce that and how they can, can distribute resources, allocate resources to mitigate that. So those, we had that big of outbreak, people had to be dying on the streets to change our ways, in, at least in Liberia. I, I hope we could learn like quickly, but sometimes we, we, it takes so much time for us to learn. Thank you, Carlos. We have one more, other, another question. Go ahead, please. Okay, the other question is, you say there are on average about two pandemics every 100 years. Is that rate increasing? What might be the rate during the past century or two? Surely it is much higher now. Um, we don't know. The problem is that, um, yeah, thank you. This, this is a good question. We are looking at, we're trying, we, we are updating, constantly updating our database. So the data that we have available suggests there's one to two, uh, uh, or two to three pandemics every 100 years. The problem with our with this with this is that there are so many mm, spillover events uh, or, the, or emergent uh, emergency events that we are not uh, getting into uh, our database. We only get the ones that are reported and then the ones that have caused essentially a big problem or a local problem in, in in the human population. So there are other things that probably happen that we completely miss. So there is no real way to 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 update that that we have this problem. On, on, on reporting effort. But yeah, so we, we every time we, there's a, a new outbreak, we update our database, and I probably I should run again the, 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 our, our models and trying to, to see, but essentially we increase like probably two or three uh, outbreaks over the past, I don't know, since Zika virus. So it's, I, I don't think it's going to change too much. Excellent, Carlos. What biodiversity metrics or essential variables would accelerate or enhance outbreak mitigation and detection efforts? Mm. Yeah, well, that leads to a philosophical problem on what is an essential biodiversity variable. Um, but um, but the, what, we, we, what we've been using is uh, um, species richness, just the number of species. Uh, in a place. So how many species we have in a place uh, as a proxy for uh, the viruses that each species can uh, harbor. Um, many of our models assume that there are a unique number of viruses in, in each mama. So if we have two species, two, tip, two types of bat in, 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 in one area, overall we will have, let's say, 60 um, viruses um, there, 30 for each one. This is just an example. It's, I need to check the numbers, um, but but then recently there has been some other other um, other metrics and uh, other people working at the community level. That means that um, we animals share viruses. They are not unique, just restricted to one. Um, and the other the other the other important part is what I'm looking at recently. It's the it's called beta diversity, which is the turnover of a species. 
because if we have two places with 10 species, that doesn't mean that both sites have the same, the same types, the same, the same types of species, the same species, the same community of species. So one area may have completely different um, species that ha harbor, I don't know, more, 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 more viruses versus the other one, the less uh, viruses. But better, better diversity is one of the metrics that I'm looking at right now. Um, we've been using more and more um, ecological metrics, but in the virolo virology world to understand these, these uh, processes as well. But this, is, this, this uh, interaction is relatively new. We've been doing this probably for the past six years, and it's, it's, really, it's um, producing very interesting patterns for viruses. In general, virologists don't use um, ecological metrics that probably we've been using for 50 years. So, but there, these are new concepts or new models that we've been able to do with them. Okay, thank you, Carlos. One, one question I also have um, that Christopher Dune asked, do typical brown bats that we have in the temperate US and in our house at this considered to be sources of viral disease. Here in South America, a lot of people live in very close contact with bats. What can you tell us about this? Well, again, all animals, including humans, have viruses. We all have that. So for example, we have um, what is called, uh, we, we all share herpes viruses. And I think in English it's cold sores that we, we get in, in, from time to time, very annoying, but we all, we all get this infection. Um, but, but the important part to remember is that some of these, um, uh, probably the bats are, are, are harboring these, these, some viruses. And these are, are the, the virus is, is very, con it's controlled. The, 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 the bat doesn't get sick or it has like a mild reaction, but same as we, when we get herpes. Um, but the, the, uh, but the, there is an increase in the viral load when, um, when bats uh, get stressed. So for example, in South America, in the dry season, there, is le there are less resources, less fruit for bats or less flowers for bats. So these bats may get um, more stressed. They have to travel farther distances to get food, etc. So they will get a little bit of stress and then the viral loads will increase. And if we happen to be interacting with these animals during that period of time, we may get one, 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 one virus uh, from that. And it, most likely it won't be pathogenic. It will just die out in, in, in a human. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's, it's important. So how, how else bats can get stressed when deforestation with, with big changes in habitat destruction, fragmentation, um, but also um, some species of animals are more resilient. So there are some species are more sensitive to, to deforestation or, or to urbanization. And bats, I, I can see bats in my backyard. And they're, I, I, well, I'm not sure, but it seems like they are doing fine. Right? And they are not, they, they, they don't get stressed with, 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 uh, with, with urbanization. And they are, they, they are, they are fine. But, uh, but I agree there are, in some cases we have rabies, for example, uh, that it's, uh, they are the natural host for rabies. So uh, there, there are viruses that are circulating. The key component of all of this is how humans, we, we humans interact with these animals. When we see um, a, 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 a dog with rabies, we don't go and just pet the dog. Right? We control, we, we can see that we can, we avoid that problem. So we need to take that, that, that sort of, um, and, and precaution when, when, when we're, dealing, we're dealing with wildlife. If we see bats, it's better not to touch them. They're going, they're fine. They're going to live on their own. And there are ways, if there are some problems, in, in, uh, at least here in, in, in the US, there are ways to, you know, like you call your local authorities to remove those bats. But in South America, I haven't seen, and that's a really good question. Um, and that's something I'm working on. Why don't we see any diseases jumping from bats in South America? That's, an, uh, we don't know yet, but, but there, there, are, there are a few um, uh, ideas that I'm working on right now. Hmm. I guess it's because we don't eat them, maybe. Yeah, that's one point. Really, it is. It is the. It has to do with be human behavior. In, uh, for example, there is a, in general in South America, um, animals that live at night has this um, idea of like taboo. You don't. You don't touch those animals. 
right? So uh, the, the, there is some uh, um, cultural um, uh, things that are getting into place in the way we, in, in South America, we get in contact with, with wildlife. Mm, we, compared to, to Southeast Asia, we also have less people, way less people. So, um, and, um, and so there are all the all, uh, things like that. But for example, we have a way higher diversity of bats in, in South America than in, in, in Southeast Asia. So um, you have all these discrepancies and we need to understand why. Okay, next question. Okay, um, next, next question. A number of um, NGOs and members of the US Congress are urging global banning and closure of all wet markets. Is that an effective strategy or are there too many other kinds of potential viral pandemics that such a ban would be ineffective? Yeah, thank you. Um, really good question. <laughs> Um, I, this, I have this, this is, this is my personal opinion. I do not agree with this uh, idea. I think it's, 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 not, it's not a good idea to ban um, um, in markets or, or wildlife consumption uh, for several things. First is, uh, one is because um, there are thousands, maybe more, millions of people that depend on, on bush meat consumption. And that's probably the only protein intake that they would have one week. Uh, there are several people, as, uh, they, they live because of that, they, they, their economies are associated with that. Unless we provide alternatives to these people, we shouldn't be discussing this, um, this, this ban. No? Um, and that's one, that's important, because right now we are, we are talking about human lives. Again, there are people, and then there have been some, already been some calls about that, that, in, that some indigenous uh, uh, communities in South America are saying like now, if we're not going to die of coronavirus, we will die from hunger. And that's because of this, this idea of banning and uh, bushman consumption, or uh, wildlife consumption. Second, the moment we ban uh, uh, um, uh, wildlife markets, the entire, the entire system, the entire market will go uh, underground. We'll, we'll be, it will be a black market of uh, wildlife. And that will be worse than the current system that we have. The current system is not perfect. I agree with that. But it will be even worse if it goes to the black market. In the black market, there won't be any control at all, zero control. And in that moment, any other species can be bring to, into, the, into the black market. And we don't know how we, with, without any biosecurity behind that, at least if we, if we straighten the, 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 the laws, if we um, help people to, 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 to manage uh, uh, wildlife um, in, in, in better ways, um, um, including increasing biosecurity, uh, uh, explaining the, the, the reasons why we are doing that, it will be a big problem if we ban uh, wildlife. Finally, I think it's a missed opportunity for education. Can you imagine if, if in, in these markets we put a big, big banner or big sign saying like, do you remember coronavirus? More than 1 million people, 1.6 million people got infected. Over this amount of people died. We were closed for months. The economy, the, the global economy tanked. And this is because we, we decided to eat uh, uh, bats. People are going to remember this outbreak, this, this pandemic. So it's a missed opportunity for education. We should be using this to educate people. And that, it will reduce, uh, um, I think, the, the, the consumption. People will start understanding this. Um, the, finally, so many places, this is a... a um, is uh, uh, related to traditional medicine. For example, in China, probably they've been doing that for 5,000 years. So now we're coming and say like, hey, stop that because we had a problem uh, on the other side of the world. It's not going to be that simple. So we need to work with social scientists to change those uh, behaviors and also to provide alternatives. And again, the underlying problem of, of this is human population growth, 5,000 years ago, there were a lot of people in China, but not as many as we have now. Excellent. Thank you, Carlos. We have another question from Gerhan Storm. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. 
Um, I would like to make an observation about the potential of transformative change and work which has to do with behavioral change would be about reduction of food waste in the European member states. I, I'm based in Brussels in Belgium and the change to plant rich diets. Uh, I think the case for this is reinforced by uh, the uh, ongoing uh, crisis with the COVID-19 uh, virus, as it is called in Europe. And I think when we focus on issues, SDG issues like well-being and health, and in relation to that public and private expenditure for health costs, I think the case for change can be made uh, with more conviction. And this is related to the reform of the European Common Agricultural Policy. I would like to stop there, but just to say that I appreciate very much what I've learned from this event, and I see a lot of uh, potential added value in uh, further exchange and uh, cooperation. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your contribution. You are totally right. Yes. So, yeah, waste, it's, uh, food waste, it's, it's incredible. So, um, I live here in the U.S. and I'm, I'm in, it's incredible for me that the, the you know, the, the food waste that we, we are we are throwing. I can't remember the numbers, but I if if you I can send a couple of papers or put it in, somewhere that, to show that how much waste, how much production that we we have. Um, we pro, we produce this this food. We use the land to produce this food, and this food goes to waste. You know, there's even because it's not a a, a red um, apple. It goes goes to waste in some some cases or in people houses that we don't eat everything we we have these big plates of food and then we only eat half of it so we are essentially wasting all this energy all this water that's been needed to produce to generate that food so it's it's we again what we need to be is smart producers smart consumers and i hope this this tragic event this this pandemic this pandemic can help us to understand our ways and can help us to change the way that we deal with, 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 our, with our environment. Thank you. Thank you again, Carlos. This is a really nice way, way uh, to end this uh, fantastic webinar. There were so many more questions, super important and excellent questions. Uh, we will send them to you so you can respond directly to, your, uh, to, to the people that um, have participated at this webinar. Again, Carlos, we are extremely grateful for, for, for your support and help and, and for teaching us all, all this about um, uh, pandemics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your questions. I learned more about that uh, as well when you ask questions and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you. Bye.